In this video, I'll show examples of MSMRI lesions associated with worse prognosis and significant disability. Now, I'm not trying to create unnecessary anxiety, and I personally wouldn't recommend worrying about symptoms you don't actually have. Also, I can't accurately predict what symptoms someone has just by looking at their MRI scans, so take this as just a general opportunity to better understand the disease. So the first thing we'll look at is atrophy or shrinkage of the brain. On the left, we can see an MRI scan of someone with no neurological disease. On the right, we see an MRI scan of someone with Alzheimer's disease, not multiple sclerosis. Just as an example, you can see these fluid-filled spaces, the lateral ventricles, are greatly expanded because the surrounding brain is shrinking. Also, the gaps between these gyri or folds of the brain, the sulci, are larger in the person with Alzheimer's disease than in the person with no neurological disease. It turns out we're all losing brain just with normal aging. The brain shrinks at about 0.2 to 0.4% per year, but in neurological diseases such as multiple sclerosis, it can be accelerated but is highly variable from person to person. Some people, it's roughly equal to normal aging, whereas some people it can be as high high as 1% per year or more, which is greatly accelerated, and brain atrophy is associated with worsening neurological symptoms, especially cognitive symptoms in multiple sclerosis, often progressive multiple sclerosis. These are some examples in MS. You can see this is an axial T2 flare MRI, and you can see the typical white matter lesions of MS, and the lateral ventricles are expanded, and the sulci are larger than normal. This is another example. Again, the lateral ventricles touching these periventricular lesions, and the sulci, or gaps between the gyri, are much larger than normal, indicating brain atrophy. Next, we'll look at black holes, which are lesions which appear dark on T1 sequences of the MRI, as shown on the left. So on the right, we see a T2 axial sequence of the MRI scan. We won't get into MRI physics here, but T2 sequences are the sequences where MS plaques are most easily seen and they appear bright. Now, some people with MS have very impressive burden of lesions, of T2 bright lesions in the brain, but they're doing well with minimal symptoms. And the reason that may be the case is because these lesions don't indicate dead tissue necessarily. There may be some injury to the myelin, but a lot of remyelination and the tissue may function okay. So on studies on pathology, sometimes on the MRI a lesion appears T2 bright but is normal on T1 sequences. And if someone did an autopsy on that person, that tends to correlate with demyelination but not a lot of injury to the underlying axons or nerve fibers. However, if a lesion is T2 bright, but also T1 dark, so a black hole, that tends to correlate more with damage to the underlying axons and more neurological disability. Now, most people with MS are gonna have some black holes, but when they're very extensive, especially when accompanied by atrophy, that's correlated with more disability, more so than just the T2 lesion burden. This is another example of subcortical T1 black holes. Here we have corpus callosum atrophy, or shrinkage of this white matter structure, the corpus callosum. So we're looking at sagittal images like this right through the center of the brain. This is the spinal cord, this is the brain stem, this is the nose, this is the tongue. And this white matter structure, the corpus callosum, connects the two hemispheres of the brain and is involved in communication from different areas of the brain. And when it's injured, this can be associated with cognitive symptoms, especially processing speed, the difficulty of doing things quickly and also multitasking. And this is a very impressive and obvious example. Normally, the corpus callosum is much, much thicker. You can also see a multiple sclerosis plaque here. There's also some generalized atrophy. You can see the sulci are enlarged and the lateral ventricle is also also enlarged. Next is an example of a cervical medullary lesion, a lesion that bridges the upper cervical spine into the medulla, the bottom of the brainstem, this white plaque. Now, this is an example from a very unique situation. This is an MRI from a 55-year-old man who actually has no other lesions in the spine or brain, very atypical of multiple sclerosis, to have a nearly normal MRI of the brain. And he has a primary progressive 
the phenotype of multiple sclerosis and an EDSS or expanded disability status score of six, meaning he needs a cane to walk 100 meters. Now this is quite rare. Usually these lesions are associated with typical multiple sclerosis plaques, but in general, these cervical medullary junction lesions are associated with progressive weakness of the limbs and often a progressive course of multiple sclerosis. This is another example of a cervical medullary junction lesion. This one looks more expansile, like it could be active, and it extends in the medulla, and we could see similar lesions in the disease neuromyelitis optica. For orientation, we're looking at sagittal images like this. These are the bones, the vertebrae, these are the discs in between. This is the spinal cord, this is the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. Next, we'll look at spinal cord lesions, and this diagram shows the general anatomy of the spinal cord, that information comes from the brain and branches off in individual nerve roots to different parts of the body. So lesions that are higher up in the spine can affect more of the body. For instance, a lesion at C1 could affect both the arms and the legs, where a lesion at T10 could only affect the lower extremities. Even a lesion at C8 wouldn't cause significant motor deficit sits in the upper extremities most of the time. We're actually looking at sensory innervation, but the muscles follow a similar pattern of innervation. So when someone has numerous high cervical spine lesions, as shown in this example, it's often linked to more disability. This is an example from a 32-year-old woman with secondary progressive MS. You can see there's a cervical medullary junction lesion along with numerous high cervical spine lesions and thoracic spine lesions and a lot of lesions in the brainstem as well, a very abnormal MRI scan. This is another example with a few high cervical spine lesions along with lesions in the brainstem. And this is one more example where there are at least three lesions at C1, 2, and 3. And of course, high cervical spine lesions aren't always associated with significant disability. There may not be that tissue damage. If there is a lot of demyelination, there can be a lot of remyelination and preservation of the axons, but it's on the average associated with more disability. Next, we'll look at spinal cord atrophy. Just like you can have atrophy or shrinkage of the brain, it can also occur in the spinal cord. This is an example of focal C7 left spinal cord atrophy. So on the left, we're looking at sagittal images like this. Here you can see the brain stem, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and C7. And behind it, you can see the spinal cord not only has a T2 bright lesion, it's also shrunken in caliber, indicating some tissue damage. On the right, we're looking at an axial image like this through that same level. And you can actually see the right side of the spinal cord looks normal, but on the left side of the spinal cord, there's not just a T2 bright lesion, but it's also clearly shrunken and injured. Now towards the back of the spinal cord, we have more of the sensory fibers. In the front and lateral aspect of the spinal cord, we have more of the motor fibers. I would certainly expect this individual to have significant weakness and numbness of the left side, though the more proximal area of the left arm, such as the deltoid and biceps, may be more spared since the nerve fibers come off from higher levels. Here is an example of global spinal cord atrophy. On the right, this is a T2 sagittal image. You can see there are numerous T2 bright lesions, and the entire cervical spine is smaller in caliber, is shrunken compared to normal, indicating significant injury. This is another example of multiple cervical spine lesions, and this lesion at C2 and C3, C4, there's less injury, but here the lesion at C5 and C6 is associated with significant shrinkage, indicating there's more damage at that area. This is an example of focal thoracic spinal cord atrophy. You can see higher up there's a normal caliber of the thoracic spinal cord, but at the area of this lesion, it's clearly narrower, indicating permanent tissue injury. Finally, there's cerebellar atrophy or shrinkage of the cerebellum. We're looking at an axial image that's lower down like this. So here you see the nasal septum and the orbits. This is the pons. There's a large right middle cerebellar peduncle lesion, very typical of multiple sclerosis. 
and this is the cerebellum. This is part of the temporal lobe, and the cerebellum appears shrunken. You can see the foliae or folds of the cerebellum are larger and more prominent than normal, and injury to the cerebellum like this can be associated with imbalance, clumsiness, and tremor. So once again, I hope I'm not causing unnecessary anxiety. I've probably seen over a thousand MRIs of people with multiple sclerosis, and sometimes I'm surprised if I review the MRIs prior to the appointment, and then I see the real person, how well someone is doing despite having a very abnormal MRI scan. So don't be discouraged, just make the best of your situation. Hopefully this was informative, and let me know if you have ideas for other videos.